We're filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive in Sarasota, Florida, and it is extreme great pleasure to have Louis Belson with us, drummer extraordinaire and band leader and arranger. Welcome. Thank you. You have just about done it all in your career, and you're still doing it, as I just had the pleasure of hearing. Um, how, how did all this come about? As a, did you start as a piano player as a child? Did I read that? Uh, actually, no. I, I was, uh, see, I come from a musical family. Yeah. Uh, my father uh, played all instruments mm -hmm. at a music store, and there were eight of us, four girls, four boys, and all of us worked in the music store. And uh, when I was about three and a half years old, my father took me to a parade. And you know, for a little person, three and a half years old, and that drum section mm -hmm. comes by you, you know, that whole sound envelops your whole body. So I pointed my little finger, I said, I want to play that. <laughs> so my dad said I was so definite about it. And, and um, he was very liberal minded as far as wanting to start at a certain time. It didn't make any difference as long as you had the interest and you wanted to do it start you know mm -hmm. so he started me and uh, uh, eventually I had uh, teachers like Roy Knapp in Chicago and then later on with uh, Murray Spivak in, in Los Angeles but uh, in the meantime by the time I had to be about 13 years old he kind of maneuvered me over to the piano uh, not to play piano as a solo instrument naturally he just uh, thought it was time for me to learn theory and harmony yeah. and composition and I I was against that, but the minute I started and, and got into it, then I realized that, yeah, I like this because there's something inside of me that says compose and arrange yeah. as well as play drums. So uh, that's what I did. I, I kept uh, studying hard with uh, my father, and then later on, uh, when I got on the road, I uh, had Buddy Baker, who just retired from Disney Studios as one of their great composers. Mm -hmm. I started with him in 1947, and he's still my teacher. We do things like decipher Ravel's Daphnis oh. and Chloe, bar by bar, this kind wow. of thing. And, but it's, it's a never-ending process, mm -hmm. you know, you just keep on learning, and that's the exciting thing about music. Well, the piano was a good idea then. Yeah, it yeah, was. Yeah. Because uh, my father said, you know, it's all right to play percussion, play drums, that's wonderful, but Someday, if you're a band leader, you'll have respect for your men more if you rehearse the band. Don't have somebody else right. rehearse it. You get out there in front and say, well, uh, let's see, that's a G minor seven <laughs> chord, and somebody's playing a D natural instead of a B flat. Yeah. And uh, so he was right. Go, oh, a drummer uh, yeah. knows that. Yes. And uh, a lot of the young drummers, well, some of the older guys, like Tani Khan was a great uh, orchestrator and great arranger. And today, uh, Billy Cobham, uh, Steve Gadd, Tony Williams, a lot of these guys are composing and writing, mm -hmm. and uh, Harvey Mason, drummers like that, you know, who are not only great percussion players, but they're very sensitive as to what music is all mm -hmm. about. And uh, when was it that you really felt that you could become a professional musician? Uh, well, I, could, I, I was very fortunate uh, they allowed me to join the union in Moline, Illinois, when I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, however, in order to play the gigs at that time, you had to play in a little beer joint, you know. They, I had to be accompanied by a grown-up. Uh -huh. He had to get me there, help me set up the drums and sit there, make sure I didn't get indulged in alcohol, yeah. and played the gig, and then he got me back home. But that was a great experience mm -hmm. because uh, one, of the, one of the greatest things that happened to me on every Tuesday night in Moline, there was a nightclub called The Rendezvous. And uh, Speck Red, a great piano player from Des Moines, Iowa, had a, a, a drummer and a bass player and a saxophone player from Kansas City. A wonderful quartet. And they allowed me to come in and sit in and play with them all night on Tuesday. Now that's where you really learn how to yeah. swing. Because when you play with a quartet like that, in front of a live audience, on stage, with other instrument players, then you really know about when to use this symbol, this symbol, how to use the brushes, be sensitive to backing up solos. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was really setting me up. So by the time I was 17 years old, I was, I was ready to go on a road. That was a perfect education at that point in your 
it was. career then. Because yeah. you can, uh, school is wonderful. Uh, the, the schooling is very, very important. Education and music and just academic uh, education mm -hmm. is marvelous. Uh, but you also have to get that training of going in and playing on the stage with other players. That you have to go out, what we used to call, get your feet wet. Yeah. And climb on a bus and uh, do some one-nighters, play in ballrooms, play in theaters, play in nightclubs. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get the feel of the, of the real music. You know? Yeah. Well, you went through a, a real succession of, of great big bands. And you're, you must have been popular because you hit them all. I was very, I was very fortunate. Yeah. Um, back home, uh, when I was 14, 15, and 16 years old, uh, there used to be uh, a couple of places, one in Moline and one in Davenport, where all the big bands came to play, the big ballrooms, Coliseum and Davenport in particular. And every time a band like Ted Weems or Harry James or Ted P. Reed, I'm naming some of the old guys now, uh, all the kids would say, hey, let Louis play the drums. You know? <laughs> so the band leader would always say, yeah, okay, where is he? And I'd get up and I'd play. You know? So when I got up and played for Ted Fiorito, he offered me a job right there. Wow. And I said, well, Ted, I got like three or four mo more months of high school. I want to get my diploma. I wanted to go to college, but uh, if you offer me a gig <laughs> yeah. and some money, maybe I'll change my mind. But, right. but I want to graduate from high school. So he waited and kept his word. His drummer was leaving anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first gig was to fly out to Los Angeles from uh, Moline, Illinois, and play the Florentine Gardens on Hollywood Boulevard, which is a beautiful, big, they don't have places like that anymore, where they had a line of girls there. They had uh, the Mills Brothers were the main attraction. Uh, Ted Fiorito's big band, Dr. Giovanni, Giovanni the pick, pickpocket, famous pickpocket, oh. band. and um, tremendous big show. I was there for three months in that place, mm -hmm. and while I was there, uh, Freddie Goodman, Benny Goodman's brother, just happened to wander in and uh, take in the show, and he liked the way I played. He sent a note over to me and I went over to the table and he said, uh, you know, Benny Goodman is out here making a picture, a motion picture, and he's looking for a drummer. <laughs> you were, so, what, 17 or something? I, I started to freeze up. Over to, <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, here Ted got me all the way from home. Yeah. I hit yeah. him within three months. Yeah. Now I get the offer to go with the King of Swing. <laughs> so uh, my audition was not really an audition. I didn't go somewhere in a room or play for Benny. Mm -hmm. uh, all he, th he did was tell Freddie, take him in, put a tuxedo on him, put the makeup on him, and I'll see him on the set. So oh we played God. one small band tune on, uh, uh, on, on the set, motion picture. After we played the tune, Benny said, okay, can we leave Thursday for New York? Amazing. I didn't have a chance to say, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute, hold it, you know. <laughs> hold it. You know? So he just, he just said, I'll see you Thursday. So Freddie said, well, you got the job. Now, <laughs> what am I going to say to Ted Fiorito? Well, I told all the guys in the band, and they said, look, Ted will be angry at first, but you go ahead and go, and we'll explain to him later on what the situation is. So that's what <laughs> happened. You know, I saw him months, that's months classic. later, and he said, hey, said, that was great. He said, but, however, you know, I thought maybe you'd stay with me a little longer. Yeah. But it was a great experience yeah. uh, joining Benny's band. And this was what year around? That had to be um, 40... Mm -hmm. 42, I think, 1942, yeah. Amazing. And you probably toured around the country quite a bit with him. Uh, yeah, I did I did uh, just under a year with Benny, then Uncle Sam got me. Mm. But I was very fortunate. I, I was. They looked at my credentials, having worked with Benny Goodman. I was supposed to go to Marsh Field with Ziggy Elman's band in California. Mm -hmm. Instead, they shipped me to Washington, D.C. Uh, <clears throat> with an excellent band. A uh, big orchestra, concert band, uh, marching band, big jazz band, small combos. So I actually did a lot of playing when I was in the service for three years. And uh, <clears throat> we were stationed at Walter Reed Hospital. And we had to play for all those amputees that came back from mm -hmm. the war. And the best medicine they could have was to hear American jazz or any kind of music. You know, it could be symphonic music, uh, chamber music, whatever, you know. Yeah, and uh, they—I played more drum solos for those guys than <laughs> I ever did back in civilian life. Uh huh. 
So that, that was a, a nice experience. Three years for Uncle Sam. And then when I got out, I went back with Ted Fiorito for about, oh, maybe three or four months again, then back with Benny Goodman. No kidding. That had to be uh, in 46. Did you give him like a week's notice this time? When you uh, yeah, I gave him a proper notice this yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. I, I it straight this time. Yeah. Then uh, after that, uh, I, uh, Benny, Benny was kind of semi-retired and he was going to go back to New York and not do too much, so mm -hmm. that left an opening for me to join uh, Tommy Dorsey in 1947. And that was a great experience. Wonderful band. He had people in there like Charlie Shavers, a great trumpet player. Ziggy Yama was still in the band then. Uh, Paul Smith on piano. Uh -huh. And uh, Tommy himself was just superb. You know? I stayed with him for three years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, joined Harry James uh, for, for one year out in California. I wanted to go to California to study with Buddy Baker, who's presently my composition teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the one year with Harry was great, and then all of a sudden, well, in that band, they had Willie Smith playing lead alto, and Juan Tizol, the great valve trombone, mm -hmm. used to be with Duke. And I stayed at Juan Tizol's house. So uh, Juan said, uh, I got to talk to you and Willie because I just talked to Duke Ellington today. I said, really? Yeah. He said, yeah, he's looking for a lead alto player. Johnny Hodges is leaving, and he's also looking for a drummer. So now what, what do we say to Harry James? So all three of us went to Harry James. We said, Harry, of course, we had an out with Harry because he wasn't working every night. He was working like Fridays and Saturdays, and that's about it, mm. just weekends. We said, Harry, all three of us said, we have a chance to join Duke Kellington's band. So he looked at us, hesitated for about 15 seconds, and he said, take me with you. <laughs> I'll never forget those words. Oh. You know? But he was, a, he was a great man. Harry was a uh -huh. great player and a sensational yeah. man besides, you know. But I did get a chance to work with him for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, of course, after that, uh, with, well, of course, with Ellington, there's so many stories to tell about that band. You know? he and Ellington himself was, a, was a, an element of surprise, always, because you never knew exactly what monumental piece of music he was doing for a certain occasion that other bands didn't do. Mm -hmm. You know, besides the ballrooms and the theaters and, and television coming in, uh, he, we were uh, in on the first sacred concert, sacred concert. that was done in, in uh, Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. So just to be a part of that was something, you know. I look back at that as a really an experience. Mm -hmm. you know? People talk about the the difference in in discipline and the way lead a band between certain guys like Benny Goodman and and Ellington. I guess had his own way of dealing with oh, yeah. with his personnel. All band leaders had uh, a different way. But the great thing about Basie and Ellington, when you analyze their situation, they were both rhythm section players, mm. piano players, mm -hmm. and when they beat off a band, unless they were doing something in television where they had to give a downbeat or something like that. But normal playing, swing, they played with the rhythm section for one, maybe two courses until that groove settled in. Mm -hmm. Then, by the time the band came in, there's no question where the time was. Rather than give it one, two, one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's a little offhand to try to capture that tempo right off the sure. bat. You have to have a strong <laughs> rhythm section to lock it in right away, see. But with them, being rhythm section players, that made a great difference. And that's why it was uh, such a joy to work for them, because uh, they established tempo, and they were both uh, so tempo conscious, but they mm -hmm. had a natural flair for knowing exactly what tempo for this tune, what tempo for that tune. Mm -hmm. They were masters with that. Something to learn from oh, yeah. Basie. Yeah. Yeah. Getting back to Ellington for a moment, was uh, did you get a chance to see Ellington and Strayhorn, how they collaborated on their music? It seems like such a fascinating thing the way they pulled that off. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, Ellington. I mean, uh, Strayhorn joined Ellington as a lyricist, and uh, from what I hear, and Billy Strayhorn told me that uh, I don't think Duke knew at first that 
that he was he arranged oh. uh, as a lyricist. So um, Duke gave Strayhorn an assignment for lyrics, and he said, "I'll check you out when I get back. We got to go to Europe." So when they came back from Europe, Billy said. I write arrangements also. So Duke said, really? He said, do you have one? He said, yeah. And that was Take the A Train. <laughs> and I think Strayhorn told me that Duke put his arm around him, Strayhorn said, you're with me forever. Wow. But, you know, that was a perfect match because mm -hmm. nobody in that band, uh, even the guys that had been there for years, like Harry Carney, they couldn't tell the difference whether Strayhorn wrote the composition mm -hmm. or whether Duke did. That's how close it was. Amazing. Um, they were an exceptional twosome. I, I would say they were both geniuses, mm -hmm. really. Very superstitious. Yeah. Um, don't ever whistle in the dressing room. Uh, Duke and Strayhorn never put a button, a fine, on an arrangement. They got down the letter S and then just let it fizzle out, and they, they worked it out at the rehearsal but never really put, like, boom, the finale there. They didn't write it, you mean? They, didn't they wouldn't write it. write it. They worked it out of rehearsal. Okay? And uh, never wore a shirt with buttons all the way down. It was only maybe three buttons this way, and then a slip over. And no color yellow, paper, but blue was his favorite color. And I made the mistake once of, of giving him a, a gift for his birthday, a pair of bedroom sh shoes. He said, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. That means you're going to be walking out of my life. So no kidding. I, I said, oh, really? And uh, so I exchanged those for a blue sweater. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, they, both, they both had that, uh, that great originality that you look for, you strive for, and you're, mm -hmm. it came natural for them. But, you know, Ellington never really went to school to learn how to write music. And uh, Strayhorn may have had a little bit, but they, they had that God-given talent mm -hmm. to be able to sit down and write music, but it was strictly their style. They weren't getting it from somebody else. Mm -hmm. it was, there it was. And the voicings and the reed section, the voicings in the brass section, um, being able to supply the band, the soloists. He knew every soloist, what their range was, so when he wrote something for you, it was perfect. Just like yeah. you're getting a brand new set of clothes and they fit yeah. perfect. Yeah. And he gave you the greatest introductions in the world. It really sets you up, you know. One thing, uh, when I joined the band, Strayhorn and I roomed together for about almost almost three weeks. And I made the mistake of telling Strayhorn one night, we were just talking, and I said, uh, Strayhorn, how did Duke voice that caravan thing? Oh man, I, I could really see the camels coming when they play that <laughs> one part. And he went like this to me, uh, uh, I said, oh, excuse me, I'm invading your privacy. So I didn't say a word, uh -huh. and I guess Strayhorn had talked to Duke about me asking and so forth, and nothing happened for about oh, three or four months, and all of a sudden, uh, we were doing a one-nighter, and Duke got up on the piano, this before the people came in, and he said, come here, to me, sit down by the piano. And, um, he showed you. He explained to me how he voiced Caravan what notes he gave to Johnny Hodges, what notes he gave to Procope, Carney, so forth. Oh. That's what I did. So I thought to myself, man, there's a great Duke Ellington that's taking time out to show me some voicings. Yeah. Other band leaders have been striving, trying to figure out what did he do there? How did he voice that? What's the, I read a quote from Andre Previn who said, yeah, um, a thousand Musicians can get together and play a chord, and Stan Kenton wrote, and all the arrangers know how to do that. And Duke Ellington writes something for three instruments, and they play it, and I don't know what it is. Uh, when you can write in in harmony and theory, it's it's really much easier to write for four voices or five voices, but to write for three voices and mm -hmm. two voices, because he had three trombone players, and those three trombone players sound like about five or six of them sometimes, you know, but. I found after working with the band, I discovered that uh, in a very short time that you could have Ellington's band play in an arrangement and then have another choice band, maybe like a New York band or an L.A. band, all great musicians playing the same chart, but the difference, the air, 
that they're putting it in their horns. <laughs> Carney, mm -hmm. Willie Smith, Johnny Hodges, Paul Gonzalez, Jim, Jimmy Hamilton, Clark Terry, Juan Tizal, Lawrence Brown, Tricky Sam. This is something that you can't explain, but the way they played it, the way they made it sound, that was it. Didn't they play some of your first charts? Uh, when I joined the band, uh, Tizal was telling Duke, yeah, this kid, he knows how to write, too. He said, well, tell him to bring an arrangement in. I said, Tizal, no way, I'm not going to do that. That was in a straight horn around. I, I, would, I would feel just this high, you know? Yeah. So he had to ask me two or three times. So finally, uh, Tizal got a hold of uh, Hawk Talks and Skin Deep. And uh, when Duke heard Hawk Talks, they, they recorded it right off the bat. What a and thrill. I, I was, I was just, uh, you know, I, you know, as a kid, I just, I couldn't get over it, you know. And it, it enjoyed some success as a, as a jazz uh, uh, cut, you know. And then uh, later on, it, we couldn't find a, a studio in those days to record Skin Deep because all that drumming, uh, they didn't, they couldn't find uh, a studio to get the clarity of all those fast beats that I was doing on Skin Deep. So Duke hesitated and he said, Let's wait on that one. So um, while we were on the road, uh, Bert Porter, who was one of the guys that brought in the Ampex Hi-Fi, oh. he recorded the band one night in Fresno, California. And when Duke heard that, he said, okay, let's record Skin Deep. So we did that out on the coast and then sent that tape into Columbia. And they wanted to know where we did that mm -hmm. because he said, we, we couldn't do anything like that. So if you look at the, or study that cut real closely, you'll discover that Skin Deep sounded very different than the other things on that uptown album. album. And that's the reason why. So it was recorded not in a studio, or was it not recorded on location uh, or something? We, uh, we, were, uh, we had finished playing Fresno. That's when we heard the, the uh, recorded tape that, the, that Bert did. And we were on our way up to Seattle. Somewhere in there, we played a ballroom. And Duke liked the sound of the ballroom, so he said, OK, let's go down uh, after the gig and do Skin Deep. And we did. We lucked out of it. And this was in the uh, 50s? Uh, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. 51. Yeah. 1951, I joined the band. Shortly after that, we uh, recorded the Hog Talks and Skin Deep, yeah. Was there any ever any problem in um, certain parts of the country with any racial um, subjects coming up? Well, yes, we did have. In 1951, they had the big show of 1951, which consisted of Nat King Cole, Sarah Vaughan, and Duke Ellington's band. They were the, the three big stars. Mm -hmm. Now, beside that, they had Peg Leg Bates, Timmy Rogers, Stump and Stumpy, uh, Patterson and Jackson, all these wonderful acts, tap dancing acts. And uh, it took us a week to rehearse that whole show because playing with Nat, Nat King Cole and Sarah, Duke and all these acts. So after we finished uh, rehearsing for a week, Duke finally discovered that, hey, we're getting ready to go down to the Deep South, you know? And in those days, uh, you had segregated audiences. And, and uh, we couldn't, you, 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 you couldn't play, whites couldn't play with the blacks at that time. Mm -hmm. and in those days, it was colored. They didn't use it for right. blacks. Mm -hmm. So now the big problem is, Duke called me in the dressing room and said, what are we going to do? I can't find a drummer to uh, take your place because it would be a, a week's rehearsal and the guys that can do it, they're all busy. So uh, Duke says, you mind being an Haitian? I said, no, okay, that's all right. You know? So uh, we got through it okay. You know, it was a little tense but because yeah. uh, the situation was still down there. Yeah. And the audience were, because they told Jack Costanza with Nat King Cole, he couldn't appear because uh, of the racial uh, thing, you know. But uh, that it was, uh, some spots, it was uh, yeah. a little, little rough, you know. But we got through it. I think uh, through, through Ellington's peaceful ways and, and uh, uh, the, the wonderful attitude that the band had, you know, kind of kind of rubbed off on everybody. Mm -hmm. But still, it existed. Yeah. And you, 
Well, it's uh, it's nice that the music had a part yeah. in helping that situation to move yeah. along a little faster, I well, guess. You know, we, did, uh, we played a date in Mississippi, and uh, there the townspeople were wonderful. They came to the rescue, uh, where we couldn't stay in certain hotels and so forth. I mean, these people came from wealthy families, too. They had Strayhorn and Duke and Clark Terry staying in one house, and Carney and mm -hmm. Russell Procope and myself in another house, and all on down the line. Beautiful homes, they fed us. So, you know, along with the bad, there's some good. Too, yes, you know? yeah. And, uh, uh, these, these, these were situations that uh, we got over. Yeah. We, 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 we dealt with it. Some, sometimes it, it's almost like a slap in the face, but you, you realize uh, what the situation is, and you go straight ahead mm -hmm. because you, you've got something to do that's valid. Right. And uh, I think when you do that, you you realize that none of those things uh, should bother the the musicality of something. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that whoever's playing that music doesn't make a difference. It's just let's play it and show where the peace and love is. Right. I read some funny story about. Did you room with Charlie Shavers for a while? We were roommates for three years yeah. in Tommy Dorsey's band. Yeah. There was another giant, uh -huh. great trumpet player, great arranger, mm -hmm. uh, great composer. He, he wrote Undecided and all those wonderful things with the John Kirby small group. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot uh, rooming with Charlie. He, he taught me a lot about music, mm -hmm. taught me some tap dance. Clips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, when you played the theater in those days, you did everything. You learned how to be an MC. Uh -huh. You learned how to get up and tell some jokes and right. do a little shim sham shimmy and time step. Yeah. As well as play your instruments, you know. Did he used to fall asleep in the tub or something like that? Yeah. This is something I read in uh, one of these jazz books, and I, I just felt I had to ask you about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my my uh, my two main teachers were Big Sid Catlett and Joe Jones. Uh huh. Uh, I had a chance to see Chip once, but Big Sid and, and uh, Joe really called me aside and said, look, here's how you play the brushes, here's how you do this, here's how you do this, and always remember, don't ever lose one. <laughs> you know, I learned that from Dizzy, too. What they meant was, when you play a, a four-bar break, make sure everybody knows where one is, because once you lose one, two, three, and four is gone, <laughs> and it never comes back. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so you always, one is very important. You know? Yeah. Oh. Well, what was your first um, association with Count Basie? Uh, the first time with Basie, let me see, was actually when I joined uh, Norman Grant's Jazz the Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. I had known Basie before that. Because in 1951, he used to, he'd be appearing in New York at the Strand Theater, and we were at Birdland, right across the street. And he used to come down, he said, and he used to, his own words were, I went straight to the bar and put my <coughs> head down and with my hands around my head and just listen to you guys and getting madder and madder <laughs> as I heard all this great music coming out of that band, you know, because he was a real Ellington fan. And vice versa. Yeah. Ellington was a big Basie fan. But I really started recording some small group things with Norman Grants, uh, with the Trumpet Kings, and, and I was in on the, uh, the, uh, the two piano things with uh, Oscar Peterson yeah. and Basie. That was a great experience. And then, um, I forget what year, in the 60s, I was to go into Birdland with my small group, and Basie uh, was going on a very important tour in Sweden for over a month, and Sonny Payne got very ill. So uh, Basie said, can you do me a great favor? I said, anything you ask. So we went to Morris Levy, who owned uh, Birdland. He said, OK, we'll fix it out. Lou, you, I'll take care of your guys, and you can play the date when you get back. So I did about five weeks with that band and recorded with them. And that was like Ellington's band. Uh, just a tremendous experience. Uh, I was talking to Frank West about that today because he was on the band, <coughs> and also Benny Powell. And uh, Basie, uh, during that time, was was trying to straighten himself out, not too much alcohol, you know, and he knew 
that I didn't drink and I had some goodies in my bag all the time to munch on. Because yeah. <laughs> over there in Europe, after 11 o'clock, everything closes, nothing, unless you know of a special place. So I stuck up on I, I, got, I got my sardines together and apple juice and crackers and everything. And after the gig, it'd be a knock on my door, bam, 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 bam. bam. Say, Who's it? Me, Basie. Now, you can imagine me sitting with Basie every night for about four or five hours, eating these little goodies and talking about life. Oh, man. That experience was, you know, that's, that was just, between him and Ellington, it was uh, something that if anybody had just one day with either one of them, that mm -hmm. would be a blessing. You know? Wow. We laughed. He was very, a very funny man, you know, and could get really deep also. And uh, his psychology was very simple, but so direct, so right, you know, just just the way he played. Yeah, I was just going to say. Big, big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah, and you got to work with him in the different configurations of Kansas City, six and the seven, and a lot of great right. albums. And then they issued, uh, while I was in uh, Europe with him, uh, we recorded four or five straight days in Copenhagen at the Tivoli Gardens. And that came out on uh, Mosaic Records, all live bassy, uh, live from Birdland with Sonny Payne, and different drummers, and then the four days in Copenhagen. And man, that sounded so great. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I had a kick out listening to myself, but listening to that band. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, uh, that was... When was when your first attempt uh, at putting your own band together? When did that come about? Um, well, during my, uh, my time with Ellington, uh, before that, when I stayed at Teasall's house, they always used to tell me about Pearl, Pearl Bailey. Because she, she was good friends with Teasalls and she occupied uh, a room in the house also. Mm -hmm. And I heard, I said, yes, I've heard of her, you know. I said, well, you two must meet, you know. So we finally met in D.C. at the Howard Theater. And uh, that was in uh, 51. And uh, uh, after four days, after I met her four days, we decided to get married. Wow. That's, we got married in London. Uh -huh. Mainly because uh, that band never took a vacation in mass. There was always two or three guys at a time, but the band kept going. Wow! So my turn was up, and, and Pearl happened to be in London, so flew over there. We got married over there, you know. And uh, that was a wonderful experience. She was a, a great lady, great performer. Mm -hmm. I'm 38, almost 39 years. Yeah. And I felt that uh, when she passed away, which was a big shock to all of us, you know, I thought, right. well, I'm going to play my drums and no more, just straight ahead. Mm -hmm. And uh, here I get another blessing. Three and a half years ago, I it's wonderful. had Francine on, on a, a wonderful cruise that we fly up to uh, Vancouver and come back on the, on the, on the cruise, you know. Mm -hmm. and Leonard Feather, we had all the oh, Clinton yeah. guys on there. And I met her the last two days of the, of the, the trip, you know. And uh, we just hit it off, and here I am again. That's after great. Three and a half years. <laughs> but she's a physicist. Yeah, yeah. She's a uh, an engineer. Okay. And now I can ask you about your shirt. Yeah. That's the right. shirt. Well, the uh, she's. A can we zero in on the shirt? <laughs> graduate of MIT and Harvard. Uh huh. And she worked for IBM for about 14 years, and uh, she's a marvelous educator. And we take a lot of pride in going into schools now and mm -hmm. doing lectures. She'll talk about education and her life as a physicist and then turn it over to me. Now I talk about Ellington and Basie. And, wow. And if there's a set of drums there and a bass player or a piano player, then I do a little bit there. Uh -huh. And we have fun doing that. The kids love that. I'll bet. Because they get a, a duo thing going there, you know. Great. And it's, uh, we do this besides... Uh, uh, me doing the clinic for the drummers and then doing the concert and right. with the band and so right. forth. So, well, you've uh, been able to employ some pretty hot sidemen with your own band, yeah. you know, and, and in addition to your own arranging, you've had some great contributions from people. Don Menza, you mentioned. Don Menza, marvelous. A great player, 
he, he's borderline genius too. <laughs> he really is. He's, he's something else. He's a great player. Uh, Pete Christie, another saxophone player. Uh, Ricky Woodard now just joined us, and he's another great saxophone player. Mm -hmm. We've got Conti Candoli uh, playing with us, and his brother. Uh, and, uh, oh, just Carl Fontana works with us mm -hmm. now and then. Frank Cesari on piano, John Hurd on bass, and. Uh, now I have three bands. You know, I have a New York band, yeah. a Chicago band, an LA band. Because if I get a gig in New York, I can't fly all those right. guys in. So right. I got a set of drums there in the library. So all we need to do is say, "That's great." Let's go, and we're ready. And I get all the good players because they love to play. Yeah, they like to play. sure do. Recently heard the Slide Hampton big band in mm. in uh, New York. Yeah, and that's wonderful. Quite a uh, some adventuresome writing yeah, there. That's great. How did the, uh, I, I meant to ask this uh, earlier on, but how did the double bass drum set oh, come to started. fruition? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Eddie Shaughnessy came to me once and he said, uh, he said, hey, did you really start the two bass drums? Yeah, I thought you did, but did Ray McKinley do it first? I said, well, I don't know, because when I was a youngster, uh, in 1938, I drew the plans for the double bass drum kit. And around 1940, I saw in Downby where uh, Ray McKinley was teamed with Will Bradley. They had a band together. Mm -hmm. They did a lot of boogie-woogie things. And there was a picture of him with just two bass drums. See? And so when I saw Ray after that, I said, Ray, were you the first one to do this? No, you were the first one. <laughs> so, you know, we were, we were playing gentlemen. Yeah, there, right. Uh, but I think Ray said it. He said, well, if you drew the plans in 38, then you're the, for the first one. Uh -huh. Because what I did, I just did a, a, a thing with just the two bass drums, but you came out with a whole set, the whole, set. The whole thing, see? Yeah. So uh, the players that followed me on that were Eddie Shaughnessy, and then Sam Woodyard, Billy Cobham, mm -hmm. quite a few drummers after that, right. you know. Right. But I got that idea because having been a, some kind of a so-called tap dancer years ago, this side of the body was as strong as this side. And uh, I always wanted to get a, a drum sound over here, not only the hi-hat, but yeah. another drum sound. So I figured, well, I can put both pedals over here, and I'll have the duo sound with the bass drum, and still have the hi-hat, and still have the snare drum and the tom-toms mm -hmm. and the cymbals here. So that was a general idea. Uh, Solo-wise, there's no limit to what you can do. In a band, playing sambas and everything, you can get a lot of interesting sounds and also setups for the band. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were some time when I didn't use that bass drum at all, the left one. A lot of times I used it, but uh, I had to use my musicality and my taste right. to make right. sure it's done the right way. Yeah, because you know? otherwise but it could... It proved to be uh, standardized equipment now, mm -hmm. so it's, a lot of people are using it. A lot of these youngsters are playing it too. I mean, really... They really got the yeah, technique yeah. and the, the feel and everything. It must have helped to be have been a tap dancer, I would think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Have you ever had occasion to uh, play with uh, Joe Williams? Joe Williams? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, there is an example. Of, well, he's such a great talent. But what makes Joe Williams so great is that not only is he one of the greatest singers in the world, but when he comes in to rehearse, he comes in like a gentleman. He knows exactly what he wants to rehearse, what he wants to work out. He does it. He's in and out with no problems. <laughs> that, to me, is a real artist. Yeah. You know, because he knows exactly what the band should sound like, what the dynamics should be, what he wants from the drummer. And he does it in a relationship like a love relationship. Mm -hmm. Here, let's all work together and get this thing going. He does it in and out. I love working with him. Tony Bennett is another guy like that. Mm -hmm. Basie was the same way. Ellington, uh, those kind of performers, uh, they, they know exactly what, what they want to do. Johnny yeah. Carson on The Tonight Show always told me he never had trouble with the biggies. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald would come uh -huh. on the show, uh, Joe Williams, Tony Bennett, Duke, whatever, whoever it was, Dizzy, in and out. It was always that person that didn't quite make it. <laughs> Something wrong with the dressing room. Started demanding I'm in room things. In the dressing room. 
I don't have a, yeah. a, a window in the dressing room. I don't have something to advance too loud. This is a, and of course, that's the last time you saw them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Did you once record um, something with Basie uh, called The Happiest Millionaire or something? I think Do you I recall did. that? I think I and did. And there was that. some sound you used with some drumsticks or something. Yeah, I yeah. used uh, jingle sticks. Jingle sticks. What I did uh, quite a few years ago, I took the, tam the jingles off the tambourine and put them on a drumstick. Mm -hmm. And Basie used to call them bells. I like those bells. Give me those bells, you know. He yeah. loved that sound. Yeah. I, I designed them strictly for maybe bossa novas and mm -hmm. Latin things. But then I found out later on, it's good for certain swing things, too. And um, uh, Basie loved them. It's a nice, nice sound. Nice D touch. Different sound. Yeah. Yeah. What's in the immediate future? I know you're playing tonight, yeah. which I'm looking forward to. What? Uh, where do you go from here? Uh, from here, we go back to San Jose. Mm -hmm. uh, Francine and I live in, in San Jose part of the time, and part of the time down in, in Sherman Oaks. That's near L.A. And uh, we, we're home for two days in San Jose. Then we're off to Michigan, Ypsilanti, Michigan. I'm playing with a uh, college band there, a big mm -hmm. jazz band, and I'm doing uh, a, uh, a piece written for me with a percussion ensemble. So I'm doing two things, and then also a clinic for all the drummers. And then from there, we come back home, we go down to L.A., and uh, we get ready to go to Montana to play a gig up there. And then we get ready to go to Bern, Switzerland with the New York band, the whole all band. All right, all right. And we we're backing up Manhattan Transfer on Three, uh, three of those concerts, and one alone with the band, and Clark Terry and Milt Hinton also, if he's up to it, mm -hmm. will be our, our guests with our band. So we got a lot of exciting things going oh, on. Oh, you, you gentlemen do get around, I'll tell you that. We keep on going. My <laughs> wife keeps saying, when are we going home? When are we going home? <laughs> wow. I'm sure you've been around the world a number of times. And well, uh, it just about. There, I, I haven't been to China yet or South America. Uh -huh. I had the occasion to go to both places, but I was always, could, you know, busy here in the States. Yeah. But someday I'll make that, and then pretty much so. Yeah, then, you'll have it covered. Cover all the territory. Yeah. Gee. But, you know, it, it, it's great fun when you're doing something that you really love that to do. Love. That's a lot of fun. And uh, as long as I can keep doing it, I'll, I'll be hitting rim shots and pressing <laughs> cymbals. Oh yeah, I got a, a new CD now that was just released on Concord, and I've always been wanting to do this. It's a salute or an honoring, honoring 12 great drummers, mm -hmm. most of them from the back era and some are in the present uh, state, and, and a few of them are still living. Like starting with Chick Webb, Big Sid Catlett, Joe Jones, Buddy Gene, uh, Elvin Jones, Tony Williams, Shelley Mann, and Steve Gadd are the new guys and Dennis wow. Chambers. And um, it's not so much drum solos, but the caption on their album is, their time was the greatest. Uh -huh. It's sort of like grooving what they did in the band. So there's a lot yeah. of wonderful big band. And, and eventually, they're going to put another CD out without me so that the student can put the headset on and have the drum parts uh -huh. and play along with that band. Oh, boy. That's quite a project. Yeah, try to capture the, the, the all those. The album is out now, and uh, disc jockeys are really enjoying mm -hmm. uh, playing it. The band is really superb. They, their performance was exceptionally mm -hmm. well. Great. Really, really nice. Looking forward to getting that for the yeah. for the college. Yeah. And uh, we should have you at Hamilton sometime. All right. You know. Sure. Maybe after the China trip. Okay. <laughs> Let us know. That's good. That's great. <laughs> well, this has really been fascinating, and I. Thanks for fitting us into a, what's been a busy day uh, here in Sarasota. Well, thank you. I, I, uh, I always say when you want to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is music, yeah. I can go on and right. on and on, you know? Okay. And uh, having a lot of fun. And by the way, uh, now I have the luxury of saying that they have a festival named after me hmm. in Moline, Rock Island, and Davenport. And uh, they have it around May every year. This is the third one coming up. Uh, ours is May the 19th this year, and Clark Terry was in on the second one. He did such a great job, he's coming back for the third one. And, I'll be done. Uh, we do it with a local band there, and we're starting to pull in uh, different people. Mm -hmm. 
and it looks like we're getting the right proper backing and we're having a lot of fun with that. It's great. That's good news. Well, thanks so much on behalf of Hamilton College. I want to thank Louis Belson for a great hour of conversation. Thank you. Thank you.